VHDL allows you to access files for reading and writing from the computer in which the work library resides. So file access actually uh, is very useful, specifically in uh, testing situations. But there's a bunch of caveats that you have to take care of while using files in VHDL, uh, specifically as far as synthesizability is concerned. Uh, first of all, in order to be able to access files from your computer from within um, designs in VHDL, and we will be doing this to do two things. First of all, to load test data and dump test results. So this is basically uh, all things that we have to do in a software test bench. And the second reason we might need to use our uh, file access is to load ROMs. So when we talked about memory declaration, we found that when you declare a memory with a read port only and with initialized contents, most synthesizers, most compilers actually will recognize that this is a, uh, a ROM. And when the contents, when the ROM is big and the contents are um, many, uh, you can't really just uh, initialize it using uh, explicit initialization in VHDL. It makes a lot more sense to do so from files. So um, it, it's either about testing, test results and test inputs, or it's about loading ROMs. And in order to be able to use files within VHDL, you have to declare two packages. You have to declare the use of two packages, uh, standard.textio package and uh, standard logic textio package. So the first package is actually the main package that you are used to allow file access. And it declares uh, two data types, uh, the file type and the line type. It also declares four functions, read, write, read line, and write line. We will talk about the two data, data types and the four functions in detail. The second package, all it does is it redefines the functions to accept arguments of standard logic data type instead of bit data type, which we will mostly be doing because we always use uh, standard logic types. And so let's, let's look here about, uh, at an example of using files uh, uh, to read and write data, and we will see the data types I'm talking about, I talked about and the functions I talked about. So you have an architecture and you declare a new um, uh, an entity of a new uh, type called file. So this is one of the two uh, data types that are defined by the standard.txt.io package, the file type. And so you are declaring two files here, right? And the files are given a handle, in file and out file, just names. And then um, this keyword indicates the type of data we will be reading or writing from the file. And it's, uh, in this case, it's text, because these files are either written or in or uh, to be read from in ASCII text format. And we are opening them either in read mode or in write mode. So whenever you open a file, this file is either going to be a read file that you read from or a write file that you write to. And this is the path of uh, the file or the path where the file resides. And then we just declared a signal, a bus, uh, standard logic vector bus. Now, um, when we want to read and write from files, we have to do so within processes. And so here you have a uh, process, and this is called the write process. So we are giving it a label, and we declare a variable within this process called output line. And it's of a data type called line. So this is the second data type that we meet. The first one was file, and it is just a file that you open or uh, for reading or writing. So it's just a handle for a file. And this is a new data type called line. And it, it is exactly what it says. It is a line of data from the file or a line of data to be written to the file. And then we begin and we use two functions within this process, the write function and the write line function. So the write function accepts two arguments. One of the arguments is a, um, is a, a of line type and the other one is a signal. So it accepts two arguments, a line and a signal. And what it does is it writes the signal into the line in a FIFO manner. 
The right line function will accept also two arguments, a line argument and a file argument. And what it does is it will write the line to the file. So what does that mean? That means that assume you want to write the value 13 to a file. So this 13 resides in a signal. Let's call this signal S. What you have to do is you have to use the right function to write S into a line. Let's call it L1. And so L is just a line of data. It consists of signals or values that are written um, in sequence. So it will just be a, a sequence of signal values that have been written. Once this line is done, once you have finished writing to it, you can then take this line and write it to the file using the function write line. And so writing to a file is a two-step process. You cannot write a signal to a file immediately. You have to write the signal to a line and then write the line to the file. And the reason we have to do this is that um, lines within the file can be of variable length. And that's the only way to do this. You have to write the line first and then write the line to the file. Similarly, when we read, and this is the second process, this read process, when we read, we need a, a variable of line type because when we read from a file, we use the read function and it accepts two arguments, a file argument and a line argument. And so when you read, you read a whole line of data. And then when you need to actually access a specific value from within this line, you use the read line function. And the read line function uses um, uh, two arguments, the line and a signal. And the value of, uh, of the contents of the line are written to the signal. And so lines contain multiple elements of data. And data is written to and read from the line sequentially. So when you use the read statement, you will read a line of data from the file. If you use it again, you will read the next line of data and so on and so forth. When you use the read line, function, you will read the first element of the current line. If you use it again, you read the next element and so on and so forth. And the same is also true for the write line and write functions. So as I said, uh, reading and writing from files is usually used to allow us to uh, access data from uh, uh, for use in test benches. So we can uh, actually access the test vectors file, which contains the inputs, the test vectors that need to be applied to the unit under test. This is done using a read process, very similar to this read process. And then we can uh, actually perform the testing and assertions online in the software test bench. And in this case, we will have a very succinct result uh, consisting of a number of uh, of um, assertions or a number of conclusions that we have made about the design, that it passes or that it doesn't pass, and then we use a write process to write these to a file. Another approach would be to just read the test vectors uh, to the unit under test and then dump every single bit of output to an output file. And then the advantage of this method is that you, that you can take this output file then and then use a higher level simulator like MATLAB or C to um, to like perform further processing on this result on these results to make sure that they are correct or to analyze if there are errors within them. So uh, let's look at how the contents of a memory can be uh, can be initialized using uh, file access. And this has two uses actually. One of them is to initialize the contents of a ROM, but also um, in a lot of cases, this, this can be used within the same uh, test bench structure that I just discussed. Because one of the methods that you can use to uh, perform tests is that you can initialize the values of all your memories to values that you know, and then allow the processor or the uh, design to work and then the design is going to read values from these uh, memories. And then once you're done, you can instruct your memories to dump their contents to an output file. And then you can analyze these results. This is particularly true of modern data path designs, which contain a lot of uh, memories because they contain a lot of time sharing between processing units. So all the data 
in the design actually is actually contained within memory banks. And so it's important to understand how data can be written to and read from memories. So here we are using a RAM to demonstrate. Notice that one, what I'm gonna do here is can be applied exactly the same to a ROM. But there's a, an important distinction between what will happen for the RAM and what will happen for the ROM. And so, um, and so what we do here is we declare a new function. And we will discuss functions in, in more detail later. But the function is simply a sub-program within VHDL that you can call multiple times. And this function is called load memory. And it has a single argument, which is the file name that you are loading from. And what it returns is a content of RAM. It returns a RAM, an initialized RAM. And so what it does is it opens a file and it opens the file in read mode and then declares two, um, two local variables. One of them is of line type because we need to read from the file to line types. And the other one is just a RAM type. So it declares a RAM um, locally within the function. And then there's a loop within the function, and this is one of the um, legitimate uses of loops. And so this loop is going to loop through the entire range of the RAM, so through all the addresses of the RAM. And for each location in the RAM, it's going to read a new line, and then it's going to read a value from the line and write it to the current position of the RAM. Once it's done, this a variable called RAM contents will now contain all the contents of the RAM that we want to initialize, and so we will return it as our return value. I'll show you uh, in a bit how this can then be used within a RAM declaration to initialize the values. But notice one thing, notice that uh, when we call this function, we're going to um, loop through the entire, through every location in the memory. And we want to think a little bit about how much time this takes. So uh, let's look at um, another function, which is uh, dump memory. And this function does the opposite of the uh, initialization uh, type of the initialization function, because all it does is it dumps the contents of the memory to a, an output file. And so uh, with what, what will happen here is that you will uh, start a dump loop and this dump loop is going to uh, go through the entire range of uh, the uh, of the memory. And so you will notice that we are using the range attribute here, which extracts the range of uh, the RAM type without having to resort to any of, uh, of the generics that we inherited. And then it's going to loop and it's going to use write and write line once per location. Notice that for both these um, uh, pieces of code, the one we used for reading and the one we used for writing, we are writing or reading uh, a single element per line. So this is the format that we choose here to write a single element per line. Somebody else could, could choose a different format, but that's up to them. So uh, you will notice that this is a function, the one we use for uh, initialization. And this is uh, actually a piece of code that will be written within the architecture. So it is not uh, it is not a function. And there's a difference between writing the contents of memory and reading them. And the difference is you can initialize the contents of memory at the start of simulation, but you need to tell the simulator when to dump the contents of memory because it's not going to dump the contents of memory constantly. And so you have to have an enable signal. And this enable signal is called dump memory contents to allow you to know, to allow the simulator to know when the test has concluded and when it is safe to read the contents or the values of memory and to make a judgment about them, which is why we also have to do this on a clock edge to keep things uh, synchronous. Now, how much time does it take to initialize the values of this RAM? The answer is it takes zero time. So this whole loop actually doesn't take any time to uh, finish and the contents of the memory will be initialized in zero time at the beginning of simulation. So uh, is this practical? Does this, is this uh, something that could happen in reality? This brings us to um, the synthesizability of file access. And again, we have to discuss this in, two, uh, in terms of two things. Are we using this with a ROM 
or are we using it with a RAM? If we are using it with a ROM, then yes, it is synthesizable. And this makes sense because all we are doing here is we are just writing the contents of the ROM in a more efficient way. If you are talking about the RAM, then no, this is not synthesizable. It is definitely something that should only be used within the software test bench. The same also applies, by the way, uh, to this process, because this process is actually going to finish within zero time. And so again, it, it's not, it's not going to be practical in, in, a, in, in hardware. In hardware, if you need to write the contents of memory, you will need as many cycles as there are uh, locations in the memory. If you need to read them, you will need as many cycles as there are locations in the memory. And this is what you have to do in a hardware test bench. But in a software test bench, things are a little bit more uh, flexible. So just one last thing is how to use this function to actually um, initialize the values of RAM. So when you declare the RAM within uh, the uh, uh, signal declaration part of, of the architecture, you will then initialize its values using a call to the function that you declared above. So we call the function load memory with an argument containing the path of the file that we uh, have uh, prepared with the contents of the RAM.